three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract one. Extract one questions one to twelve. You hear a podiatrist talking to a patient called Kimmy Potts. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Thank you for letting me know about your condition, Mrs. Potts. I've not had to remember so many details about my family in a while. Is there a reason why you wanted to know? So sorry. It's because there is one school of thought that intermittent claudication may have genetic causes, and I wanted to rule these out before we move on to the discussion of treatment. So wait, you think I have in inter intermittent claudication? But don't worry. The condition is manageable and treatable. And you think it's been passed down? Well, like I said to you, my mum's legs are absolutely fine, and I've never heard of my dad suffering from any cramps during the night. Is there anything else that could have caused this? There are a few causes, one of them being peripheral artery disease. Admittedly, it's a little premature in your case. All that means is there could be hardening of the arteries. From accumulation of cholesterol plaques that form on the inner lining of the arteries, it may also be caused by a blockage in the artery, meaning that your calves cannot get enough blood. The cramps usually follow on, and can be known as rest pain. It's usually the next stage. How long did you say that you've been feeling like this? A good long while now, maybe three months or so, maybe even longer. I didn't really think anything of it at first. I understand. But I'd like to have my diagnosis confirmed with some tests, and I'd like to do that as soon as possible. That's fine. I'm more than happy to do that. What kind of tests will I need? You'll likely need a scan to work out where the thickening or blockage is. You'll also need an A B P I. Oh wait, I think I've had one of those on the thirteenth of August. That's the one where they take images of the bones to see if there's anything that's. Broken, isn't it? Not quite. That was likely a routine X-ray. An A B P I is an ankle brachial pressure index to test the blood pressure differences from your upper limbs and lower limbs. Okay. What do I need to do for that? Can we have it done today? We can, but to start off with today, I'd like to test the circulation of your feet. This will involve me feeling for your pulses. And using a Doppler machine to listen to them, this will let me know if they are monophasic, biphasic, or triphasic, or in other words, have one, two, or three audible sounds. Right. I'll then pass this on to the vascular team, and they can take it from there with all the other tests that need doing. Is that okay? Yes, I guess. I'm just a bit overwhelmed, is all. One minute I'm absolutely fine, going about my day as normal. The next minute I'm keeled over with pain that comes and goes as it pleases. 
Now you're telling me that I'll have to be strapped to machines and have pulses taken and Dopplers shaking. It's all a bit overwhelming, you know. I can understand that. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to go and see whoever I need to and have whatever tests that are necessary. It's just that I wasn't expecting this. I mean, I'm quite young, only 24, and I'm in excellent health. I've been eating a strict veggie diet for as long as I can remember, and I detox regularly. I wake up at 6 a.m. each morning so that I can do some exercise before work, and that includes Zumba and Pilates. Other than a short spell of diabetes in 06, I've never had any medical conditions or even any reason to go and see my GP until now. I understand. It's tough to take in, but understand that we're here for you. All of us. And I'm happy to book a review with you in two weeks to go over the test results with you. Don't worry, Mrs. Potts. Really. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a physiotherapist talking to a patient, Eric Robertson. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. I know that you've been seeing my colleague, Mel, and she has left me some notes, but because it's your first time with me, Mr. Robertson, would you begin by telling me a little about your shoulder and the treatment that you've received so far? Let's start from the beginning, shall we? How did it happen? Yes, well, I've had this problem now for seven to eight months because of an incident with an ice pick. I'm an ice packer, you see, so I'm constantly having to make this sort of motion to dislodge some ice. One day while I was working, I found that my shoulder just packed up all of a sudden. The pain was so intense, like nothing I ever felt before. And when I went to my GP the next day, he booked me in with Mel. And now you. Was it the first time anything like this had happened? Yes, it is. And how long have you been at your job? For three years. And what were you doing before that? I was working in a warehouse. I've always had similar jobs in a warehouse, picking and packing, that sort of thing, since I left school at 16. And you're? 25 now. Okay. What about your medical history? Any related injuries before? No, nothing. I mean, I've been diabetic since I was little. The diabetes that means that I have to have insulin injected into me every day in my tummy. But I don't know if that will affect my shoulder. Other than that, nothing else. Okay, Mr. Robertson, so today I'm going to teach you two shoulder exercises that you can do at home that are really simple, okay? Can I borrow a pen? I'd like to write it down. Yes, of course. First of all, I'd like you to relax your shoulders. You would need to lean over slightly, allowing your right arm to hang down. Then I'd like you to swing your arm in a small circle, about a foot in diameter. Perform 10 revolutions in each direction once a day. As your shoulder pain subsides gradually, Increase the diameter of your swing, but never force it. Increase the stretch by holding a light weight, only about one or two kilograms, in your arm, okay? Okay, and how often should I do that? Only once a day. Have you got that? Yes, thank you. You said that there was another exercise? Yes, 
It's called the Crossbody Reach. Oh, Mel showed me that one. That's the one where I would use my left arm to lift my right arm at the elbow and bring it across my body. She said to exert a little pressure to stretch the shoulder and to hold the position for 15 to 20 seconds. That's it. You'd aim to do that one 10 to 20 times a day. All at the same time, or should I space it out? I would space it out. Okay, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to go over? No, I think we've covered everything. Are you allowed to give me medication, or is that something that I would need to see my GP for? Medication for your shoulder pain, you mean? Yes, please. I was on Cocodamol before, but that was changed because it wasn't working fast enough. Right now I'm on Codidromol because I'm not allowed to take aspirin, and that seems to be working just fine for the pain. Let me have a look at your file. Oh, yes. Your doctor has authorized this, so yes, it looks like I can prescribe some pain medication for you. Let me have a look at this a little more closely. That is the end. Part B. In this part of the test, there are six short extracts relating to the work of health professionals. For questions 25 to 30, choose answer A, B or C, which you think best fits according to the text. Question 25. You hear part of a talk on a medical condition. Now read the question. Autonomic dysfunction can be caused by a myriad of the following factors and more than one can concur even in the same patient. Degenerative neurologic diseases such as Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy, and pure autonomic failure presenting or suffering from orthostatic hypertension and fixed heart rate responses, etc. An immune-mediated attack, either idiopathic or paraneoplastic, can be a source of focal or generalised autonomic dysfunction, as in Guillain-Barre syndrome or an autoimmune autonomic ganglionopathy. Metabolic and toxic damage, as in diabetes mellitus, amyloidosis and Fabry disease. Genetic disorders, like in dopamine beta-hydroxylase deficiency and familial dysautonomia. Abnormal reflex responses in carotid sinus hypersensitivity, vasovagal syncope and other neuromediated syncopes, and probably in postural tachycardia syndrome, POTS. Abnormal sweating responses, as in generalised or focal hyperhidosis, related to an excessive activation. Traumatic or tumoral spinal cord injuries at different levels and presenting with the so-called autonomic dysreflexia. Question 26. You hear a plastic surgeon talking about ageing. Now read the question. Aging is characteristic to all living organisms, 
and humans often regard it with some level of fear and trepidation. The thought of losing smooth, clear, and bright skin in exchange for folds and wrinkles seems enough to put a damper on many a spirit. The good news is, a number of anti-aging procedures can be effective in ridding your skin of dullness and excess pigmentation as you grow older. When the process is completed by a certified surgeon, skin procedures such as lasers, chemical peels, facelifts, microdermabrasion, and several others can be used to improve the quality of your skin and combat the effects of aging. Question 27. You hear a nurse talking to a patient about eczema. Now read the question. Yeah, I've uh, brought my son in and um, he has been scratching and has eczema on his, his hands and his arms and it's been going on for a while now. I just don't know, I don't know what to do. Oh, so I mean, have, have you been before previously, have you got any information on the eczema or? Not really, no. no. Um, I thought it would go away. I thought, it, you know, it would be something that just a childhood mm -hmm. thing or just, you know, a temporary thing and it would go out of it. But, um, well, I mean, some people, certainly it can seem like they grow out of it because it might be something they've suffered with as a child and mm -hmm. then it could be a multitude of reasons why they don't have it as an adult. They could just grow out of it. It could be that you're using specific products, washing powder. It could be something that is aggravating the eczema. Okay. And then as people grow up, they tend to change their routine and, and it doesn't affect it anymore. You know, certain soaps um, right. could, be, okay. could be irritating that. What, what about uh, people have told me food allergies can be a thing? I mean, I, I probably think that might make sense because he's just started eating like you know solid foods and things like mm. that so i mean certainly people can have allergies towards a certain food mm. um with regards to you know causing or aggravating eczema yes um something that um you could look into further but i personally don't think there's going to be anything that's going to be massively contributing to that okay question 28 you hear discussion of a news article. Now read the question. Well, this can't be right. Monkeypox? What's that? This article says that it's rare disease caused by the monkeypox virus. It usually originates in Central and West African countries, but there's been two cases in the UK so far. The article says that it spreads after close contact with infected people and that the symptoms are usually fever, headache, muscle ache, backache, chills, fatigue, and swollen lymph nodes. Plus, a rash can develop that covers the sufferer's face and other parts of the body. It looks like they've contained the disease in the UK, and the two people who've got the disease aren't linked to one another, but both of them have recently been on trips to West Africa. Thankfully, transmission from infected people to the general population is extremely unlikely, and the two patients are getting the best care from some of the best tropical disease specialists in the world. Question 29. You hear discussions of a news report. Now read the question. This news article has to be a joke. A local school that asks parents to respect the rights of others who do not want to vaccinate their children is now struggling to manage a severe chickenpox outbreak? 
An estimated 80 pupils have been diagnosed with the infectious disease within the last fortnight after the condition was contracted by an unvaccinated nine-year-old student. Those with the condition make up a quarter of the entire school, whose records showed that only 73.2% of pupils had been vaccinated against chickenpox, compared with a national figure of 92.1%. I can't believe this could happen considering the fact that the government Government in Victoria have introduced the no jab, no play policy. That was supposed to mean that all children enrolling in preschools and nurseries had to have up to date vaccinations or pre approved exemption. They really should have made it mandatory for primary and secondary schools too. Question 30. You here? Part of a GP consultation. Now read the question. Hello, my name is Stephen Williamson, one of the doctors here, and you must be Mike. What brings you here to see me today, young man? I fell off my bike, sir. Oh, ouch. Is that how you've ended up with that nasty gash there? Yes. I think I was going too fast. I was trying to make my bike go up on one wheel, and I lost control. My mom says I'll have a scar for the rest of my life. Well, not necessarily the rest of your life, but you will be able to see something there until it fades. I'm going to stitch that up for you to stop the bleeding, and so you don't get an infection, okay? Will it hurt? No. First, I'll clean and numb the area, and I'll give you a local anaesthetic. You may feel a little tug during the procedure, but it's more irritating than painful. I'll also book you in an appointment to come back in 7 to 14 days to have them removed. It would have healed by then. Thank you. That's okay. In the meantime, I need you to keep the wound bandaged and dry at least for the first day, and you'll need to wash around the wound with clean water at least twice a day. I'll prescribe you with some jelly rub to put on it too. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear a healthcare practitioner talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose answer A, B or C, which you think best fits according to the text. Extract 1. Question 31. To 36. You hear a doctor, Courtney Stanton, delivering a presentation on atrocerosis. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Courtney Stanton and today we're going to discuss atherosclerosis. This is a disease in which plaque builds up inside your arteries, the blood vessels that carry oxygen-rich blood to your heart and other parts of your body. Plaque is made up of fat, cholesterol, calcium and other substances found in the blood. Over time, plaque hardens and narrows your arteries. This limits the flow of oxygen-rich blood to your organs and other parts of your body. Atherosclerosis can lead to serious problems including heart attack, stroke or even death. The exact cause of the condition isn't known, however studies show that it is a slow, complex disease that may start in childhood. It develops faster as you age. Atherosclerosis may start when certain lifestyle factors damage the inner layers of the arteries. These factors include smoking, high amounts of certain fats and cholesterol in the blood, high blood pressure, high amounts of sugar in the blood due to insulin resistance or diabetes. Plaque may begin to build up where the arteries are damaged. Over time, plaque hardens and narrows the arteries. Eventually, an area of plaque can rupture or break open. When this happens, blood cell fragments, called platelets, stick to the site of the injury. They may clump together to form blood clots. Clots narrow the arteries even more, limiting the flow of oxygen-rich blood to your body. Depending on which arteries are affected, blood clots can worsen angina, chest pain, or worse, cause a heart attack or stroke. Researchers continue to look for the causes of atherosclerosis, and they hope to find the answers to such questions as why and how the arteries become damaged, how plaque develops and changes over time, why plaque ruptures and leads to blood clots. They are particularly aware that there are certain risk factors. In fact, many factors place you at risk of atherosclerosis. Some of these risks can be prevented, whilst others cannot. The first risk factor is family history. If atherosclerosis runs in a person's family, then they may be at risk of hardening of the arteries. This condition, as well as other heart-related problems, may be inherited. Lack of exercise. Regular exercise is good for the heart. It keeps the muscles strong and encourages oxygen and blood flow throughout the body. Living a sedentary lifestyle increases your risk of a host of medical conditions, including heart disease. A third risk factor is high blood pressure, which can damage blood vessels by making them weak in some areas. Cholesterol and other substances in the blood may reduce the flexibility of arteries over time. A fourth risk factor is smoking. Smoking tobacco products can damage blood vessels and other areas of the heart. The final risk factor that I'll highlight today is diabetes. People with diabetes tend to have a much higher incidence of coronary artery disease. Most symptoms of atherosclerosis aren't noticeable until a blockage occurs. Common symptoms include chest pain or angina, pain in the leg, arm and anywhere else that has a blocked artery, shortness of breath, fatigue, confusion, which occurs if the blockage affects the circulation to the brain, and muscle weakness in the legs from lack of circulation. Once a blockage occurs, it's generally there to stay. With medication and lifestyle changes though, plaque may slow or stop growing. They may even shrink slightly with aggressive treatment. Treatment options include lifestyle changes, reducing risk factors that lead to atherosclerosis will stop or slow the process. That means a healthy diet, exercise and no smoking. These changes won't remove blockages, but they are proven to lower the risk of heart attacks and stroke. Medication. Taking drugs for high cholesterol and high blood pressure will slow and may even halt atherosclerosis. They could also lower the risk of heart attack and stroke. Doctors can use invasive techniques to open up blockages from atherosclerosis or go around them. Stenting. Using a thin tube inserted into an artery in the arm or the leg, doctors can get to diseased arteries. Blockages are visible on a live x-ray screen. Uh, angioplasty and stenting can often open up a blocked artery. 
Stenting helps to reduce the symptoms, although it does not prevent future heart attacks. Bypass surgery. Surgeons harvest a healthy blood vessel, often from the leg or the chest. They use the healthy vessel to go around the blocked segment. These procedures can have complications. They're usually safe for people with significant symptoms or limitations caused by atherosclerosis. Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear an interview with Dr. Craig Harrisburg talking about avoidant personality disorder. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. My name is Dr. Craig Harrisburg, and I'm a mental health professional specializing in psychiatric well-being. My topic today is personality disorders. People with avoidant personality disorder, or APD, have a lifelong pattern of extreme shyness. They also feel inadequate and are hypersensitive to rejection. APD can cause psychiatric symptoms that create serious problems with relationships and work. If you have APD, you might have difficulty interacting in social and work settings. This is because you may fear any of the following. Rejection. Disapproval. Embarrassment. Criticism. Getting to know new people. Intimate relationships. And ridicule. You may also have trouble believing that people like you. When you're sensitive to rejection and criticism, you may misinterpret neutral comments or actions as negative ones. Researchers today don't know what causes avoidant personality disorder, though there are many theories, however, about possible causes. Most professionals subscribe to a biopsychosocial model of causation. That is, the causes are likely due to biological and genetic factors, 
social factors, such as how a person interacts in their early development with their family and friends and other children, and psychological factors, the individual's personality and temperament, shaped by their environment and learned coping skills to deal with stress. This suggests that no single factor is responsible. Rather, it is the complex and likely intertwined nature of all three factors that are important. If a person has this personality disorder, research suggests that there is a slightly increased risk for this disorder to be passed down to their children. There is no way to know who will develop APD. People who have the disorder are typically very shy as children. However, not every child who is shy goes on to develop the disorder. Likewise, not every adult who is shy has the disorder. If you have APD, your shyness most likely grew as you got older. It may have gotten to the point that you began avoiding other people and certain situations. Your doctor may refer you to a mental health professional who will ask you questions to determine if you have APD. To be diagnosed with APD, your symptoms must begin no later than early adulthood. You must also show at least four of the following characteristics. You avoid work activities that involve contact with others. This is due to fear of criticism, disapproval, or rejection. You're unwilling to get involved with other people unless you're sure they will like you. You hold back in relationships because you're afraid you'll be ridiculed or humiliated. The fear of being criticized or rejected in social situations dominates your thoughts. You hold back or completely avoid social situations because you feel inadequate. You think you're inferior to others, unappealing, and inept. You're unlikely to take part in new activities or to take personal risks because you're afraid of embarrassment. Psychotherapy is the most effective treatment for APD. Your therapist may use psychodynamic psychotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. The goal of therapy is to help you identify your unconscious beliefs about yourself and how others see you. It also aims to help you function better socially and at work. Psychodynamic Psychotherapy Psychodynamic therapy is a form of talk therapy. It helps you become aware of your unconscious thoughts. It can help you understand how past experiences influence your current behavior. This allows you to examine and resolve past emotional pains and conflicts. Then you can move forward with a healthier outlook about yourself and how others see you. Psychodynamic psychotherapy produces lasting results with benefits that continue after treatment. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, is another form of talk therapy. In CBT, a therapist helps you recognize and replace unhealthy beliefs and thought processes. Your therapist will encourage you to examine and test your thoughts and beliefs to see if they have a factual basis. They'll also help you develop alternative, healthier thoughts. Medication The FDA hasn't approved any medications to treat personality disorders. However, your doctor may prescribe antidepressant medications if you have co-occurring depression or anxiety. People who don't receive treatment for APD may isolate themselves. As a result, they may develop an additional psychiatric disorder such as depression, agoraphobia, substance abuse problems. Treatment doesn't change your personality. You'll most likely always be shy and have some difficulty with social and work interactions. But treatment can improve your symptoms and help you develop the ability to relate to others. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your work.